Let's look at this problem. The first part of the problem asks us to find the tension in the string. And when we're looking for a force, we draw a free body diagram. Uh, the simplest free body diagram is for the ice. I have a gravitational force. That's 300 newtons because this is 30 kilograms. Uh, then ask are there any magnets? No. What touches the ice? Well, there's the ramp. It pushes with a normal force. And there's the string, and it pulls with a tension force. Whenever I have a ramp problem, I rotate my coordinate system so that it lines up with the uh, ramp. And then all of my forces are lined up with my coordinate, except for weight. And I always break it up the same way. I look in the direction of the normal force. I go the other way until I can make a 90 degree turn. And this would be the Y part of the weight in that coordinate system and the X part of the weight in that coordinate system. Now if I do it that way, then the angle of the ramp is this angle here. And that means that this is going to be 300 newtons times the cosine of 37 degrees or 240 newtons, and this will be 300 newtons times the sine of 37 degrees, or 180 newtons. Now once I've broken up that weight into components, I throw away the original, and I use the fact that this 5 meters per second is a constant 5 meters per second. And that means the acceleration is zero for both the ice and the brick. This diagram has to scream balance. That means that this tension force has to be 180 newtons, and this normal force has to be 240 newtons. So. Now, that's part A. Part B asked us to find the power delivered by the string to the brick. Now power is the Verdun divided by the time. And in this case, uh, the string is pulling down on the brick, down the incline, and the brick is moving down the incline. And that's going to be positive Verk. And I can write that as positive force times the speed. So that's going to be plus 180 newtons times 5 meters per second equals positive 900 watts. Now, we're asked um, about the friction force on the brick. If I draw a free body diagram for the brick, I have a weight force that's only 100 newtons, because it's only 10 kilograms. I have a normal force by the ramp on the brick. I have this tension force by the string on the brick. That's 180 newtons. And then I have this friction force. It's kinetic friction. If I break up the weight force like I did before, I get 80 newtons and 60 newtons. That means this normal force must be 80 newtons. The diagram has to scream balance. This friction force has to balance the tension and the X part of the weight. So it's got to be 180 newtons plus 60 newtons equals 240 newtons. So for part C, the friction force is equal to the tension force plus the X part of the weight, which is greater than the tension force. Now, part D asks us 
is the mechanical energy of the ice earth system. So by mechanical energy, that's what we typically call total energy. And that's the kinetic energy plus any potential that we have in the problem. There's no spring, so that's gravitational energy. And if this block is moving at constant speed, it's always got the same kinetic energy. So that is the same. But the block of ice is getting closer to the center of the Earth. So the gravitational potential energy is decreasing for the ice-Earth system. And that means that the total mechanical energy is decreasing. Now the only way that mechanical energy can decrease is if we have some external VERC doing negative VERC. Well, the string is pulling opposite the direction the block is trying to go, and so it's doing negative VERC on the ice-earth system. And the power delivered, this is part E, the power delivered by the string to the ice, well, it's the same tension force, the same speed, but now the string is pulling opposite the motion, so it's going to be minus 180 newtons times 5 meters per second, or minus 900 watts. Remember, a watt is a joule per second. So every second that goes by, the string robs 900 joules from the ice and delivers it to the brick. Now, you'd make, that would make you think that the brick was going to increase its energy, but it's also decreasing its energy. And that's because the friction is doing more negative there each second than the 900 joules that the string is giving every second. So the brick or system is also losing energy. See if your neighbor did this one correctly and ask them why they voted it off the island. There's going to be several places on the exam tomorrow night where you need to solve a basic collision problem. And remember, we never, we never, we never ever, I'm going to say it again, we never ever solve a collision problem with energy. Always momentum. Always. Okay? Now this is the basic collision problem. You've got two blocks, they collide, I give you one of the velocities, I ask for the other velocity. Now. The, uh, the one way to solve it, if you want to do it in your head, is just to say, hey, the red block, 4 times 8 gives me 32 francs, and it's to the right, so it's positive. The blue block, well, 12 times 4 is 48, and it's negative because it's to the left. If I add those together, I get negative 16. And that's what has to be conserved, the total momentum of the system. And so that means that after the collision, I still have to have negative 16 for answer. Well, that red block has negative 12, 4 times 3 to the left. Well, if the total is going to be negative 16, the blue has to make up for the rest, negative 4. So the minus sign tells me it's got to be moving to the left. The question is, what speed do I multiply by 12 to get 4 francs on? Well, the answer is a third. Okay? Now, if you were going to just blindly plug and chug, 
And that might be something that you want to do if you're nervous, is just trust the math. You would just say, momentum is conserved for the system. And because that's a vector equation, I need a coordinate system. Initially, I have four kilograms moving at eight meters per second. It's to the right, so it's positive. I have 12 kilograms moving at four meters per second. It's to the left, so it's negative. Then the collision happens. Then I've got the four kilograms moving at three meters per second to the left. And then I've got the 12 kilograms. I don't know whether it's moving left or right, so I make it a positive variable. If I solve for that positive variable and I get a negative number, I know it's going to the left. I just plug and chug, and sure enough, I get a third. Now, the other way that we can dance this problem is to have them stick and ask what the velocity is. Well, if they stick, I've got the same information before the collision. But after the collision, if they're all moving together, I can treat them as one object that has mass 16 kilograms and solve for that variable. Now, if the total momentum has to be a negative 16 and I have 16 kilograms, that's going to be easy to solve. It's just one meter per second to the left. Again, I hope you can solve those in your sleep. See if your neighbor can solve those in their sleep. Another thing that you'll be asked to do tomorrow night is, uh, is have something scraping across the pavement. And we can ask you, how far does it scrape before it stops? Or how many seconds, according to your Mickey, does it scrape before it stops? These are fundamentally different problems with different solutions. If I want to know how far it slides, I use energy. Okay? Now, if it's a level road, I don't have to worry about gravitational energy. There's no springs. So when I say energy, I mean kinetic energy. And it had some kinetic energy, and then it scrapes to a halt, and it has no kinetic energy. This negative arc is negative because the friction is acting one way, while the motion of the car is the other way. And by definition, that's negative air. Now, you'll notice, this is an aside, you notice I haven't put all the equations up on the board today. I just assume it's the day before the exam. You've got those memorized. Because tomorrow, tomorrow night, you're gonna have to have them memorized. If you look at the sample exams I gave you, the few equations that are on the front page of those sample exams are the few equations you're going to be given tomorrow night. And if you ask the proctor for anything that's not on that page, they're instructed not to give it to you. Okay? You have to have those memorized coming into the e exam. So let's plug and chug here. If the mass is 500 kilograms and it's moving 20 meters per second, then I can uh, solve for the kinetic energy. If I know the mu sub k is a half and the normal force is 5,000, then the friction force is just going to be 2,500. I solve for delta x and I get 40 meters. If I want to know how much time it slides for, that's a momentum problem. E energy never tells us about the time. That's just fundamental. Okay? So the 
Initial momentum is m times v. When it comes to a halt, it has no momentum. And what bleeds away the momentum is the impulse, the friction times the time. And that's negative because it's pointing in the negative direction if I'm calling the direction of the velocity positive. If I plug in my values, I get a delta t of 4 seconds. Again, you should be able to do that uh, without breaking a sweat. Now, if the car is going 20 meters per second when the brakes are hit and it, it screeches to a halt, what's the average velocity during that 4 seconds? It's not the fastest of 20. It's not the slowest of zero. What is it? It's 10 meters per second. And if it covers 40 meters in a time of 4 seconds, its average speed was 10 meters per second. So it makes sense, does it not? OK. Um, I've got some sample problems for you. Uh, these problems came from last semester's exam. I thought it would be good to work some more problems, get you feeling more sure of yourself. Oops. Now, we're going to get through these problems, but if we do something that just doesn't seem understandable to you, uh, the solutions have also been posted to D2L, so you can just go there and look at them all night long. Okay. Now we uh, in this problem we start with a block, four kilogram block at rest. We push with a constant push for two and a half meters. It gets it up to speed, and then it goes across that rough patch where it slows down. Then it goes down a frictionless uh, semi uh, hemispherical track, and then it goes up and bounces into a spring and turns around and comes the other way. At the turnaround point, the spring is compressed half a meter. Now, the first thing we're asked to find is the verk done on the block by the friction force as it goes across that two meter patch. Now, we'd better get a negative answer, right? because the friction is acting to the left and the block is moving to the right. So our answer is going to be there by the friction is going to be minus that friction times the distance. Well, the friction is going to be mu sub k times the normal force and if I draw a free body diagram, I'm going to have a weight force uh, on the block of 40 newtons. I'm going to have a normal force of 40 newtons. And I'm going to have this friction force equal to mu sub k times the normal force. So that's going to equal 
0.7, that's the coefficient of kinetic friction, times 40, times 2 meters, or negative 56 joules. The next part of the problem asks us, how hard is the hand pushing? Now the hand pushes for the first two and a half meters. So I'm, I'm talking about Verk. It's definitely an energy problem. So I write down my energy Verk equation. Now, if I want to learn about the push by the hand, I better have my initial time sometime before the hand pushes and the final time sometime after the hand pushes. Now, we're told that when the block gets here, it's going 9 meters per second. So I know everything about the energy of the block here. And so that should be my final time. I want my initial time to be on the other side of the push, so that means it pretty much has to be A. Now, at each of those events, A and C, I ask myself the same three questions. At A, is anything with mass moving? No. Is anything up off the floor? Yes. So I have gravitational energy. Are any springs stretched or compressed today? No. So that's my energy. Then I go to C and I ask the same questions. Is anything with mass moving at C? Yes. So I have kinetic energy. Is anything up off the floor? No. Nope. That's the floor. Is any spring stretched or compressed? No. So that's the energy. Now the vert that's done between A and C has two parts. There's positive vert done by the hand. And there's the negative work done by the friction. Right? The hand puts energy in, the friction takes energy out. Now, I go and I put in my formulas. This is going to be 4 kilograms times G, 10 newtons for each kilogram, times a height of 3 meters, plus the normal force that I'm looking for, times a distance of 2.5 meters, minus 56 joules, is equal to 1 half times 4 kilograms times the speed, 9 meters per second, squared. That's the thing about energy problems. It's always after two steps. It's algebra. It's as if we were down in uh, Wilson Hall, heaven forbid. Okay, and we just have to solve for the one unknown, and we get the normal force by the hand on the block is 39.2 newtons. Okay? Now the next part asks us to find the acceleration at point C. Now at C, the block is not speeding up, it's not slowing down. It was speeding up, it will be speeding, slowing down, but at C it's just turning. It's on a curved track. So that centripetal acceleration, <coughs> V squared over R, that's going to be 9 meters per second squared over 3 meters, or 27 meters per second squared up. Now folks, the problem asks for the magnitude and direction. Whenever I'm looking for a vector, I always ask for the magnitude and direction. In every single one of those problems, the direction is worth one point. Some of you don't want that point. A lot of you just keep forgetting to do the direction, and we keep taking away one point. And it seems not to bug you. It should. It's not that hard to say, oh, okay, that gets you a point. 
Now, D asks us to find the normal force by the track on the block at point C. Well, I draw a free body diagram. I've got a weight force of the block equal to 40 newtons. And I have a normal force by the track on the block that's much bigger than 40. How much bigger? Well, that's given by F net equals MA. Well, that's going to be, my mass is going to be 4 kilograms. My acceleration is 27 meters per second squared up. And that's going to be 108 newtons up. This diagram has to scream up by 108 newtons. That means the normal force has to be 148 newtons. Because 148 minus 40 is 108. The last problem asks us to find the spring constant of the spring. Well, if I'm looking for a spring constant, it's definitely an energy problem, because you don't see the spring constant in the formula for momentum. So that last, we would go to the energy equation. I'm looking for the, the spring constant, so I want one of these points to be when the spring is compressed at the turnaround point. Um, the initial, I get to choose. I could choose it all the way back at A, but then I got to take into account all the work that was done. Or I can choose to, to start at C. That's going to be easier. Because at C, I know what the energy is, and there's no work between C and the turnaround point. So this is going to be kinetic energy. At the turnaround point, it's up off the floor, so there's gravitational energy, and there's spring energy. So this is going to be one half times four kilograms times nine meters per second squared is equal to four kilograms times G, 10 newtons for each kilogram, times the height up off the floor, which is 1.5 meters, plus one half K, that's what I'm looking for, times half a meter squared. And that's just algebra. And if I solve for K, what I get is 816 newtons per meter. Check that your neighbor's still on the bus, people. Do a buddy check. Um, some of you are still struggling with two-dimensional collisions. Uh, let's try a couple. Let's try this one on the back of this page. Now, the, uh, the car has momentum of 300 kilograms times 18 meters per second, and that's 5,400 franchise. The truck has momentum that is 600 kilograms times 12, that's 7,200 franchise. Now this was on the exam last semester, 
and the most common wrong answer was the total momentum is 5,400 plus 1,200, that's 12,600 francs on it. That's not only wrong, but sick and wrong. What we need to do is make our table, separating out the x part from the y part in a standard coordinate system. The car has momentum in the x direction. The truck has momentum in the y direction. The total for the system, I just add up the columns. So if I go 5,400 and 7,200, the total is going to be this vector here. And that's going to be 5,400 squared plus 7,200 squared square root. And that's going to give me 9,000 francs. This angle, that's going to give you one point. That angle is given by the inverse tangent of the opposite side over the adjacent side. And that's going to give you 53 degrees. Now that means that the momentum total before the collision is 9,000 francs I at 53 degrees north of east. Now the second part of this problem is trivial. It asks, What's the total momentum of the system after the collision? If they lock together, uh, what's their momentum? Or even if they don't lock together. The key is that momentum is conserved in every collision. And so if it was 9,000 franci before, it's still 9,000 franci, and it's still directed 53 degrees north of east. And we would just say momentum is conserved. Okay? Now, we're asked to find the velocity of the mangled two-in-one vehicle. Well, normally, the momentum of the system, the total momentum, would be the mass of one object times its velocity plus the mass of the second object times its velocity, and so forth. But if they stick together, if their bumpers lock and they move together as one unit, I can treat them as one unit. And it would have a total mass of 300 plus 600 kilograms. And then they would all be moving at some final velocity. So I would write this as 9,000 franci at 53 degrees north of east is equal to 900 kilograms V final. If I solve for V final by dividing both sides by 900, I get V final is equal to 10 meters per second at 53 degrees north of east. Okay, we all on the bus? Now they want the kinetic energy of the mangled two-in-one car right after the collision. Well, that's just a plug and chug problem. Using the formula for kinetic energy, I would say kinetic energy after collision would be one-half times the 900 kilograms times the 10 meters per second squared, and that's going to be 45,000 joules. 
And now they say if the coefficient of kinetic friction between the vehicles and the road is 0.35, how far will they slide before they come to a rest? Well, how far means energy. So I would say, and, and in this case, energy is kinetic energy. I would say energy initial plus varic is equal to energy final. The energy initial means at the beginning of the slide. Well, it starts sliding right after the collision. So that's going to be this energy here, right after the collision. When it scrapes to a halt, its kinetic energy will be zero, and that's because there's negative air done by the friction force over the distance. Now you know how to find a friction force, you've done it over and over and over again. So you can find that friction force, uh, you can solve for delta x, what you will get if you solve that is 14.3 meters. Okay. Questions on that problem? Let's, with the time remaining, let's look at one more. My apologies to those of you who came last night. We worked this problem last night. But for those of you who weren't there, we're just going to do it very quickly. We have this meteor, I'm sorry, an asteroid, coming in in the x direction and then it explodes. And you remember that an explosion is a type of collision. So this would be a two-dimensional collision problem. So let's solve that. Now, I'm going to need this table. Now, if I if I add up the momentum of all of the fragments, that's going to give me the total momentum of the system. Well, the total momentum of the system can't change. That means it's got to be the momentum that this asteroid had before the explosion. And it's all in the x direction. I got 250 kilograms going at 3 meters per second. That's going to be a total momentum of the system of 750 franci in the x direction and zero in the y direction. Well, after the collision, it's all got to add up to that same amount. Well, if I look at fragment one, it's going to the left, but I don't know how fast. So I would write that momentum as negative 50 kilograms V1. Is V1 going to be a positive or a negative number? Positive. positive. It's a speed. It's a magnitude. I already said the direction was left by putting the minus sign there. And there's going to be none in the y direction for 1. Now if I look at fragment 2, it's got a momentum of 120 times 5, or 600 franci, and it's going at an angle of 53 degrees. Now, if I break that up into its x part, to go up and to the right, I've got to go to the right, and I've got to go up. So I'm going to have a positive x and a positive y. This is going to be 600 
times the cosine of uh, 53 degrees, and that's going to be 360. This is going to be 600 times the sine of 53 degrees, and that's going to be 480. So I put that in, 360 and 480. Now here's where we have to use conservation of momentum. We don't know how fast this last fragment is going, but we do know that it's going at 37 degrees. So, I know that I've got something with momentum 37 degrees. But I also know that this Y column has to add up to zero. And so that means that this third fragment has to have a Y part equal to negative 480. So that means that when I break up this vector, the Y part has to be 480 down. But I don't know what this X part is. Well, I can do that two ways. A plug and chug way would be the tangent of 37 degrees is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side, and I could solve for Px. The other way I could do it is to recognize that this is a 3, 4, 5 triangle. This is 3 times something, 4 times something, 5 times something. And 480 is 3 times 160. So 4 times 160 would be uh, 640. And 5 times 160 would be 800. So now I can come up to my table and I can put 640 for uh, fragment 3. Now the last part of this problem asks us, uh, how fast is fragment 1 going? Well, we've already used the y part and added it up. Let's use the x part. If I add up that x part, I find that minus 50 kilograms times V1 plus 1,000, right? That's Frank's side. 360 plus 640, think of it as money. You got a grand. That's got to add up to 750. Well, if I subtract 1,000 from both sides, I get minus 50 times V1 is equal to minus 250 franchise, or V1 is going to be 250 over 50, or 5 meters per second. We already know it's to the left, because we put the minus sign in all the way at the top. The speed is 5 meters per second. Check that your neighbor understood how to work that problem. My experience as an old guy has been that those of you tomorrow night that have the table will also have the right answer. And those of you that don't have the table will not. So if I were you, I'd put the table. Okay, good luck tomorrow night, people.